You know, Korea's kind of a big deal in the world these days. A K future, we might say. So I've been asked why Korea? Why aren't I standing on another stage in India or China or Canada or France or the United States? And all I can say is, as a sociologist, I don't think any of these other nations can pull this off. I think it's Korea. That's the simple reason that I'm here, that we're here and not somewhere else. Hello. Hello. So five months ago, I stood on this Sabasi stage and gave a talk that I titled, We're Going Off a Cliff, Call Korea for Help. And in that talk, I said that Korea is, in my opinion, the only country in the world that might show the other 8 million of us, 8 billion of us, how to creatively reorganize social and economic life in order to avert the calamitous climate changes that are upon us. And as fate would have it, Seoul experienced unprecedented flooding just two months after I delivered that talk. I watched videos of the destruction the water caused. And then all summer, I turned my attention to regions throughout the world that were experiencing environmental disasters. And I kept reading statements like, the first time ever, an unprecedented weather event, historic. Most of these places had never experienced anything like what they were experiencing, just like in Seoul. So I've been tracking climate science for two decades, and I've watched careful and moderate scientists across a wide range of disciplines conclude over and over that a significant number of weather-related disasters are directly linked to the human production of CO2. They also conclude that we should expect these events to become not only more frequent, but also more catastrophic. And while they urge us to alter our economic and social systems, because they still think that we have the power to turn things around, business as usual prevails. This collective arrogance makes me shiver. At the end of my talk last May, someone in the studio audience asked for practical ideas and solutions for all of this. And my response was, that answer will have to be another talk on another Sabashi, Sabashi stage. And so here we are. And while I've given many thousands of lectures in classrooms and hundreds of talks to public audiences all over the world, I have never struggled as much to respond to a single question. Of course, we have to change human systems. But that's not a practical solution. So I started to reflect in earnest about this with the person with whom I have been collaborating for three decades, my intellectual muse and my collaborator, my wife, Dr. Lori Mulvey. But before I turn the stage over to her, I want to emphasize that we speak to you as Americans, as people who live in another nation that is also responsible for making revolutionary system changes. But I must emphasize my growing belief that if Korea cannot lead the rest of us, then perhaps no nation can. So I've been working with and studying small groups my entire adult life. And I think a commitment to people working in small groups is at the core of a meaningful response to altering the course we're on. I know it sounds strange, but yes, small groups. 
not population groups, not the masses, who we're told could change humanity's fate by doing things like recycling and using less plastic and turning off the air conditioning. Now, those things matter, especially, we're told, if billions of people act differently. But I'm focused on a particular set of small groups who are often overlooked. Small groups that are composed of people with exorbitant levels of power and influence people who shape systems all over the world. They already have a profound influence on social and economic systems, and these people working in small groups could activate large-scale changes significant enough to alter our current trajectory. They can, and I think must, redirect their power into the project of building a lower-carbon future, a K-future, we might say. How? By rolling up their sleeves and meeting in small groups face-to-face -to, -face to create nation-level economic, technological, and social changes by collaborating all for the greater good. Not only is this task momentous, it's nearly impossible. Why? Two reasons. One, because systems are agents of stability. They resist change. And two, because change actually creates social disruption and disorder, and seeking to alter a stable system is usually not a peaceful, uncomplicated affair. But that's where the rest of us, who are not elite influencers, can play a role. We'll get back to that shortly. So, ironically, just five days after I stood on the Sebashi stage, the Korea Chamber of Commerce and Industry brought together many of the most important business leaders in your country. I didn't know this at the time, but I was giving another talk just a couple of kilometers from where they were gathering. And the purpose of their meeting was to officially launch the new entrepreneurship initiative to create more jobs, and address social issues. Climate change was actually one of the issues on their agenda. So this is a group that has the level of influence that Lori was discussing. But of course, an obstacle to what we need them to do is the fact that each individual shoulders the responsibility for the economic success of the company or organization that employs them. Next year's economic forecast matters more to their employees and stakeholders than what happens in 2042, 20 years into the future. But with great power comes great responsibility. These very smart and capable people know that we are living in a dangerous and difficult time. It's why their instinct to bring this group together is prescient. And so I would like to speak to them for a moment. You cannot operate in ways that are entirely familiar. As I said in my first Sabashi talk, we know Korean culture is grounded in communitarian principles that motivate you to consider the interests of other Koreans at least as often as you push forward your own. But as a business leader, you also have to be inclined to protect your brand to compete with others inside and outside your national borders, and to move your own interests forward. And with that said, every sociological premise I know will conspire to keep the new entrepreneurship initiative in a business-as-usual mode, which means your plans will probably not be groundbreaking. And if you fail, Korea fails. And then we all fail. But what the world needs and what Korea needs is another miracle on the Han River. So let's talk about how groups operate because we don't have to fail. Groups can be smarter than individuals, meaning that when people think together, what they're doing creates more than the sum of their individual parts. This is the moment when oppositional ideas, they don't fight each other, 
they build towards a third way. Groups rarely get this far because they're usually not properly managed with expert attention to group process. This is how they become grave supporters of the status quo, mm -hmm. regardless of what good intentions they have. So I want to share my favorite parable here about the elephant and the blind scholars. The parable tells us that there is a truth, in this case, the, the elephant, and each of us only sees a part of it. Moreover, other people see things that we don't see. In this image, each blind scholar recognizes something real, a tusk or a tail or an ear, but it's not the whole truth. Even worse, over time, groups argue with each other about what part is more true. People become tusk people or tail people or ear people. Not one of them will ever have seen the elephant, though. I know this sounds silly, but it's a perennial human problem. You can notice it everywhere, from international conflict to marital conflict. But we so easily forget that we only see a part. No one sees the full picture alone. The blind scholars can collaborate, not compete, and arrive at a comprehensive vision of what is true. So as we approach this climate crisis, we have to remember that we're blind scholars forever stuck in the narrow views of what is true and what is important and our vastly limited vision of the world around us. It's crucial then that we think together in small groups with others who are just as smart but have different knowledge. Innovation is built on this kind of collaboration. Now, if the individuals who are part of the new entrepreneurship initiative are willing to take on the project of innovating toward a K future, each one of them must be willing to ask their colleagues, what do each of you see that I don't see? A commitment to humble curiosity is the foundation of real collaboration. And, but what about everyone else? What does this mean for the citizens of Korea? For you all? That was the original question posed to me. We haven't forgotten that. And of course, you need to keep reducing waste and the consumption of energy. People all over the planet need to do this. But there's something else, something very real, something v without specific action steps. Let me describe this terrain. As we've said, the changes needed to move the needle back on our warming planet will provoke deep tensions, uprisings, even violence, in populations all over the world because people react against the everyday discomforts and uncertainties that are associated with doing things differently. And to be honest, this kind of social destabilization could be the deal breaker, even with an innovative vision. So a crucial question for each one of you to consider is this. If high-level small groups envision new strategies to address the climate crisis, and we don't know if they can, but if they can, how can citizens like you support the implementation of those plans? What do the Korean people need to consent in order to change? So answering this question is what you need to do and can do. Your actions in the past 60 years demonstrate that you might be able to pull off this monumental innovation, this project, because you, the people of Korea, have been able to operate on an uncommon and unusual trust and put your nation first in crucial times. You have the cultural and the historical tools to implement system change without breaking apart. You've already had the experience of making possible what is impossible. So I think it's the equivalent of donating gold to the national treasury to pay off your nation's debt, only much, much bigger. So I've been asked, why Korea? Why aren't I standing on another stage in India or China or Canada or France or the United States? 
And all I can say is, as a sociologist, I don't think any of these other nations can pull this off. I think it's Korea. That's the simple reason that I'm here, that we're here, and not somewhere else. You know, Korea's kind of a big deal in the world these days, I have to say. And if Korea can make a difference, can make these advances in how to avoid climate catastrophe, I'm betting that nations and cultures around the world will follow. They'll get swept up in the K future just like they're already caught up in the tide of the K culture. I pray that you can do this. Let me know, let us know what we can do to help. Thank you. Thank you.